السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وأصلي وأسلم على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Blessings upon all those who have followed him, all those who are following him, may Allah make us from amongst them. And all those who will follow him until the day of Qiyamah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our offspring from amongst them. Ameen. Honored ulama, beloved brothers and sisters, dearest listeners, yesterday we made mention of the incident of Uqbah ibn Abi Mu'ayt, where he had declared the shahada at one function where he had invited Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter when Ubay ibn Khalaf met him and convinced him to actually go and na'udhu billah spit on the face of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we all heard what had happened and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses declaring the regret of Uqbah ibn Abi Mu'ayyat on the day of Qiyamah and the lesson is for all of us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ on that day the oppressor will eat his hands because of his regret meaning on the day of Qiyamah this oppressor will be eating his hands out of regret and he will say why didn't I choose the road or the path of the messenger why did I take such and such a person as a friend besides Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the guidance came to me, he led me astray. Definitely, shaitan is most deceiving. We all know that Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat decided to take Ubay ibn Khalaf as a friend and listen to him and reject this shahada after he had uttered it. This shows us that the friends we keep, we need to be careful. If these friends are going to turn us astray, and if these friends are going to lead us away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must identify such people and stay away from them. They are not our true friends. True friends are those who can help you when you are wrong. Not always tell you that which suits your heart and that which will make you happy. A true friend is a friend who will tell you words that might be bitter at times, but out of friendship, they know that this is the best for you. This is something very important. We have become very different nowadays in the sense that those who tell us what our ears want to hear, they are our friends. And those who tell us what our ears do not want to hear, they are not our friends. So what happens? We continue doing whatever we want to do. That is one avenue, which is also wrong. We must understand a person who is a genuine friend will at times tell us, I disagree with you. I don't agree with the way you are doing this. I don't want to associate with someone who is doing this and that and that. We must be happy if this person is a genuine person who is a friend of ours. It is something that they have told us out of love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding that love does not mean they must agree with us all the time. Sometimes out of love they will disagree and they will tell us that which is bitter. Similarly, if we are going to allow sometimes those who are close to us to lead us astray, to deviate us from salah, to take us away from the masjid, to take us away from the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our company sometimes drives us to discard the Islamic dressing that we might have adorned. If that is the case, then those are not genuine friends. On the day of Qiyamah, we don't want our plight to be the similar plight as Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat, where one would actually be eating his hands out of regret to say, I should have never had this person as a friend of mine because all they did was lead me astray from the straight path. And after the guidance came to me, they still succeeded in leading me astray. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast and may He grant us the acceptance to have as friends those 
those who will constantly remind us to be as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as can be. And those who will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a daily basis. Ameen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at his time, there was a man known as Al-Walid ibn Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. The same Uqba that we are speaking about, his son, in the battle of Badr, what he had done is, he faced Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was a young man, a young boy in fact, a teenager at the time. And when he faced Ali radiallahu anhu, he told him, Oh Ali, today you are facing me with a sword. You are younger than me, I am older than you. So I am one point above you. The next point that I am above you is that my speech is far better than yours. I am very eloquent and you are not. And the third point is, you see these spears behind me, I have much more than the spears you have. Meaning the arrows that I have for my bow are much more than yours. So don't try and tackle me on this day. Ali radiallahu anhu told him, I am a mu'min and you are a fasiq. I am a believer and you are one who has gone away and gone astray. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us iman at all times. And it is reported that this youngster was actually killed on that particular day, on the day of Badr. This was the son of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, whose name was Al-Walid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses regarding the statement of Ali radiallahu anhu. Is the one who is a mu'min, similar to the one who is a fasiq, they are never equal. You know, at times in terms of the dunya, one might have more than us. In terms of eloquence, they might have more than us. In terms of weaponry, someone might have more than us. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what counts is the iman we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can surrender to His commands at all times. And may He grant us iman that is strong and powerful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for those who have iman and do good deeds, for them Allah will grant Jannah as their abode. And as for those who have transgressed, who have gone astray, who have left the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their abode will be hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from the fire of Jahannam and our offspring as well. Ibn Abbas rahimahullah radiallahu anhu mentions in a hadith which appears in Sahih Muslim that at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were a group of mushrikeen who had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, Ya Rasulullah, we would like to accept Iman. But if we accept Iman, we have committed so many sins. And we know yesterday we spoke about the way Wahshi radiallahu anhu had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him all the questions. This was another incident, another few incidents whereby certain mushrikeen had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, Ya Rasulullah, we want to accept Islam and we want to become mu'mineen, but we have committed shirk and we have killed certain people and we have committed so many sins, immorality and so on. So the verses were revealed, the verses of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah says, besides those who repent to him and believe and do good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them will convert their bad deeds into good deeds on the scales on the day of Qiyamah. For indeed Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. One might ask that the verses of the Quran, were they revealed just for one incident or were they revealed for many incidents? Let us clarify that today. At times there were several incidents that occurred and then revelation came once to clarify all four, five, six incidents with one verse. And at times what would happen is an incident occurred and a verse was revealed. Another similar incident occurred and a similar verse was revealed. And at times the same verse was revealed twice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed these verses whenever they were needed so that 
these verses could act as a solution for those who had problems at that time. And similarly, every Ramadan, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam used to come down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they used to go over the portion of the Quran that was revealed and the order was given. Remember, the order of the Quran that we have today is the same order of the Quran on the preserved tablet known as Allawhul Mahfuz. That Lawhul Mahfuz is known as a preserved tablet. The order on the Lawhul Mahfuz is the same order of the Quran that we have now. But the verses were not revealed in that order. The verses were revealed in a different order as we know. As and when the incidents occurred, these verses were revealed. Every year Jibreel alayhi salam would come, so much so that on the last year Jibreel alayhi salam came and went through entire revelation twice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us memory to memorize as much of the Quran as we can. Ameen. So that is when the order of the Quran was actually clarified and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, some of them had memorized it better than others. Some of the top reciters of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhum jami'an. These were some of the top reciters of the Quran and there were many other top reciters. We all know at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, together with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they could recite the Quran better than anyone else. Then after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had left, we find Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu engaged the Muslimin into some battles. The battles of the renegades, those who had turned away from Islam. And some of these qurra, some of these reciters were martyred. And that is when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu got the companions together and said, let us sit and let us bring together this Quran in the manner it was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because many of the reciters have been martyred. And we all know that then the Quran was actually brought together at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. What was there was consolidated in a certain manner. And to this day we have the same Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the acceptance to read it. So, as I had been mentioning, at times verses were revealed once, sometimes they were revealed twice. There are some verses that were revealed in Makkah, and thereafter they were revealed again in Madinatul Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the true understanding. Another narration, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reports in a hadith in Sahih Muslim regarding Abu Talib. We did mention this incident, but we are going to mention very briefly because there is another verse connected to the same incident. When Abu Talib got to his deathbed, we know that the people of Quraysh were gathered around him. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was there and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was telling him, Oh my uncle, recite one kalima and I will fight your case on the day of Qiyamah. Ya am, qul kalimatan tuhajju laka biha yawm al-Qiyamah. And this uncle refused to utter the words because he was worried what the people of Quraysh would say about him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was touched and his heart was hurt by the fact that his own uncle, who had really helped him quite a lot, had not accepted Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses comforting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and reminding him that guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will not guide, or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's duty is to deliver the message and the guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You will not guide whomsoever you wish. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the owner of guidance who will guide whomsoever he wishes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and our offspring and may he keep us all on Islam. May he grant us the ability to abstain from wrongdoing, to abstain from sin and to engage in sincere tawbah in these last days of Ramadan from the sins we may have been committing. Ameen. At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was yet another enemy of Islam known as Al-Harith ibn Uthman. Al-Harith ibn Uthman came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day and told him, O oh Muhammad, we know that what you have come with is the truth. And I'm sure the statement we've been hearing it so much, showing that the Kuffar of Makkah knew that this Quran uttered the truth. It came with purity. Whatever its commands were, were pure. Whatever its prohibitions were, meaning the prohibitions, the people were being prohibited from those things which were evil. So this Al-Harith ibn Uthman, he said, we would have followed you. But if we follow you, there is one fear. 
That fear is that this land that we are ruling, this land that we have, the land of Mecca, it will be taken away from us and it will actually be snatched away from us because those Arabs around us, majority of them don't believe in what you have said. So if we are to accept the truth, then our land will be taken away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the statement of Al-Harith ibn Uthman where he says, وَقَالُوا إِنَّ اتَّبِعِ الْهُدَى مَعَكَ نُتَخَطَّفْ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are saying, if we are going to follow the guidance with you, that means they are confirming that this is guidance. If we are going to follow the guidance with you, then our land will be snatched away from us. We will be driven out of our lands and it will be taken away from us. Now, what lesson we have to learn from this is, we need to stick on the right path. We need to stick on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared and decided for us. If in the process, we feel that we might lose a thing or two. Remember, there is much more to be lost by turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may die minutes from now. We may die right now. We may die in a few days, in a few years. Every single one of us has to go through death. Then what is going to happen? These little things that we used to fear we might lose, everything will be gone. None of us goes into his or her grave with all his or her property. And that property, even if someone had to bury it with a person, will not help that person in any way. What will help us is how much we have obeyed the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from the stories that we are hearing on a daily basis and the verses that are being recited on a daily basis. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from amongst those whose hearts have been hardened. We know guidance comes from Allah. Let us constantly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. Then Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was another enemy of Islam who went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to choose you? You are an orphan. You are a man who does not have a lot. Your father was non-existent when you were born. And your mother had died when you were very young. You had a very difficult, tough upbringing. Why didn't Allah choose someone who was a very strong man in society, someone who was very strong from one of these two great cities? One was Makkah and the other city was at Ta'if. These were the two major cities. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this. And the fact that this man, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, the first thing he had said, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send a messenger from one of these two major cities, someone who was grand and great, Allah says, are they the ones who distribute the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in another verse, responding to this statement of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is your Rabb who creates whatever he wishes to create and he is the decider. He is the one who chooses whatever he wants to choose. This helps us in the sense that when we see ilm and knowledge being given to certain people by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must understand that Allah decided to have knowledge given to them. A very important hadith which Ibn Kathir rahimahullah has mentioned. He says on the day of Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call the sincere ulama, those ulama who work sincerely. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, O oh, scholars of deen, I have kept this knowledge in you solely because I love you. I would like you to enter Jannah without hisab and kitab. Allahu Akbar. If I did not love you, I would have not kept this knowledge in you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ikhlas. Because the condition here is sincerity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really and truly use us to serve deen in whatever way possible. We should remember, if we have served deen, it is a sign of acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is no goodness of ours. It is nothing that we can be proud of and regard as a chip on the shoulder. Or we can lift our noses two inches above everyone else, thinking that the air up there is slightly fresher than the air below. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen to us. The more we have spent, the more we have been used, whether it is knowledge, whether it is wealth, whether it is some sort of service, whether it is sacrifice in the path of Allah, let that never ever 
blow our heads and minds up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humbleness. The more He has used us, the closer we should come to the ground. And remember, مَن تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Whomsoever will be humble for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise such a person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter makes mention of some of the people who had not made hijrah with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at that time it was compulsory to go and make hijrah. It was compulsory to leave Mecca and to go to Medina to Munawwara. They were a group of people who had not left immediately. And then when they decided to leave, the mushrikeen followed them and troubled them and harassed them and drove them back. So verses were revealed in Madinatul Munawwara to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These verses were then sent to the people in Makkah. What were these verses? The, the first verses of Surah Al-Ankabut. The opening verses of Surah Al-Ankabut. Alif Lam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do people think that it is enough for them to say we are believers and then they are not tested? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have tested those before them. And we will test every single one of them in order to distinguish and differentiate between those who are truthful and those who are liars, those who are not truthful regarding their iman and regarding their belief. This verse was sent to those Muslimin who were still in Mecca and then they decided, they said, look, let us create a group and we will leave. If anyone comes to try and tackle us, we will fight them. And even if we die in the process, there is no problem so long as we accept this verse that was revealed in our regard. This is how they looked at it. Today, we all will be tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will test you when it comes to your wealth. I will test you when it comes to your family members. I will test you with death. I will test you with hunger. I will test you with drought. I will test you with so many different things, all sorts of difficulties. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for a true believer, every single difficulty of this nature is actually a gift for that person to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we know that the hadith Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalah. It is only when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone that he puts tests in that person's life. And the other hadith says, Idhamul ajri ma'a idhamil ibtilah. The greater the test, the greater the reward. Similarly, the Quran says, Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with those who bear patience. From this we understand that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a worshiper to get closer to him, he puts a difficulty in his life so that he bears patience, so that Allah becomes closer to that person and that person becomes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Had it not been for that problem, this person was not going to be accepted to engage in an act of worship known as sabr. It is only through the engaging in sabr that this person then achieved closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding of that statement. So when they made hijrah finally, they were fought and some of them lost their lives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed yet another verse regarding the same group of people. That Allah says then for those who made hijrah after they were oppressed and those who were tested regarding this hijrah and they had to fight for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is most forgiving for those people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared his forgiveness for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness. Another incident at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the incident of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. 
he was one of the ten who were granted good news where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them that they were from the people of Jannah. They already knew it whilst they were in the dunya. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, it is very interesting how they accepted Islam. When Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu accepted Islam, a group of his friends, a group of his very strong friends went to him. Who were these people? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Sa'id ibn Zayd, Uthman ibn Affan, Talha radiallahu anhu, and Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu. They trusted this man. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was an intellectual. He was very intelligent. He was a noble man. They went to him and they said, Oh Abu Bakr, you believed and accepted what Muhammad ibn Abdullah has come with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, yes, I immediately accepted it. They said, if that's the case, we are also accepting it now. And they went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they accepted him as the messenger, and they declared their shahada. What did they do? They trusted Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this in the Quran, saying, Follow the path of the one who turned to us, the one who came to us. Who is that? That is Abu Bakr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and the others that follow the example of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Then when Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas became a Muslim, his mother, who was also the wives of one of the leaders of Quraysh, her name was Hamna. She decided that my favorite son has now accepted Muhammad's call, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I can't, I can't accept this. So she called him. She said, listen, O Sa'ad, I am going to stand in the sun and I'm not going to comb my hair and I'm not going to eat and I'm not going to move and no matter what happens, until you disbelieve in Muhammad, I'm going to stand out there. No one will be able to move me. So she went out and she stood. So Sa'ad looked at, looked at her. He tried to talk to her. She did not want to speak. She just said, look, you disbelieve in him. That is when I will move. And this lady stood there for one day. It was the favorite son. He tried. He told her, oh, my mother, do what you want. You can either stand or you can either sit or eat or not eat. It's not going to affect me. If you had 99 lives and your life was lost one after the other, this that you have asked me to compromise is more dear to me than that. So I'm not going to compromise this. So one day passed, the second day passed, she didn't have anything. The third day she fainted. And when she fainted, verses were revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed upon everyone to be good to their parents. Whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, you must be good to your parents. You must obey them in everything that is not the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, you have a mother or a father who's not a Muslim. They ask you to pass them the water. They ask you to go and do them a favor. They ask you to go to the shops for them. For as long as there is nothing haram involved, then it becomes a duty for us, even if they are not Muslims, to be good to them and to obey those type of commands. This verse was revealed on the occasion of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas's incident. If they are striving to turn you away and to let you go back into shirk and to implement those things which you have no knowledge about, those things which are incorrect, then don't follow them. So these were the rules and regulations regarding how to treat parents who are not Muslims. We must be best to them. But when they have commanded us to engage in shirk, it's not allowed. When they have commanded us to go and buy them some alcohol, then you must explain to them, look, that's where I stop. When they have commanded us to go and do something haram, that is where you tell them, look, I will obey everything else, but this is where I will draw the line. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu thereafter went to his mother and explained to his mother, she was not, she was in a very bad condition. 
and he told her, look, verses have been revealed in my regard. I will be best to you, but on this point, I don't compromise. It is reported that she started eating. Where was she going to go? She started eating and everything sorted itself out. It is not reported that she accepted Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance and make us all obedient children. I'd like to end off by saying, if the ruling regarding parents is so powerful when they are non-Muslim, the vast majority of us, our parents are Muslims, and still we find ourselves disobeying our parents. Surely we need to do something about this and we need to put an end to this disobedience. We need to ask ourselves when we have our own children, do we want our children to treat us in the same way we are treating our parents? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.